Um, okay, second talk is Michael. He's over here. Um, I'll let you talk. Introduce yourself. Thanks. So uh, again, the same question. Oh yeah, everyone can hear me. I can hear myself. Great. Um, so if this talk ends up being quite negative, in a sense, let me know, because uh, uh, here we ended up uh, writing our own flex framework, and we think it's better than everything else. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of, oh yeah, they don't do it well. So I, I'm really sorry if I offend someone. That's not my, uh, that's not what I really want to do. Maybe at, at some places. So um, yeah, you, you can't see what I can see over there, so I'll wait a second. Uh, and uh, also at the question time, if you think that this idea is crap, then do let me know, please. Uh, can you? Oh, you can. OK, so uh, let's move on. So we started a work for a client around 10 months ago. And we needed uh, something that's isomorphic for some business reasons. And we wanted to use Flux and uh, React at, at the same time. And we looked at the frameworks, and we didn't really like them. So there was Flexible. It was kind of starting at the time. Uh, I think Re Reflux didn't yet start, and we did not like flexible at all. So a uh, client was fine with us writing our own framework, and we decided, yeah, if they want to pay, let's do it. So here's a quick recap of uh, how the Flux architecture works, and especially how it works in our thing, which I'll explain in more detail later. So generally, uh, you've got a component that requests something. It creates an action for that. The action creator can talk to the API, whatever, and then return the action. And the actions are dispatched to the stores, and then the stores, in turn, can forward this data to the component, and the component can actually take the data from the stores themselves, uh, even if it's not forwarded. So uh, for us, the two special things are the action creators and uh, the dispatch phase. They're quite different from everything else, I think. And this is going to be kind of like a third of theory and me just standing here, then the live demo, and then actually some code, which uh, hopefully won't break. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, when we were designing this framework, and in reality, somewhere in the middle, it turned out that we think it's more predictable, easier to use, and with the free isomorphism compared to everything else. So compared to flexible, we have a lot less boilerplate. Uh, compared to Reflux, for instance, uh, we have a lot more structure, actually, in the code, and the structure feels kind of natural. So, to the point. Uh, the state in the stores, oh, maybe just to be sure, how many people here actually kind of work with Flux or use it at a demo app or actually know what I'm talking about now because, you know, <laughs> if not, okay, that's good. I assume you, you all know. So, um, the state in the stores is in one place. So it's not that the state can be anything. The state is in this dot state, just, in your, just the same way as in your components. Also, the state is immutable. So all the bugs coming from the fact that you've, you're mu mutating the state in the stores in your components because you pass the object by reference, or, I mean, you pass the object, are gone um, by design. Uh, there are also the failed before and after modifiers for the actions, so each action if it fails, you can listen to it. You don't have to create your own action for the failure. And it's there automatically. Um, also, the components, they can listen to those modified methods, let's call them this way, and not to the actual actions. So you've got a guarantee that the action will only uh, influence the store. It won't influence the component. But you can still uh, do something with the fact that the action had started. So you can display the loading screen or whatever and then stop displaying it when the thing uh, finishes and without listening to the action itself. And the actual dispatching phase, so if we go back to here, so the dispatching phase is actually executed uh, uh, not concurrently. So one action is dispatched, then another action is dispatched, then another action is dispatched. Uh, so essentially, it, this is synchronous, uh, which solves a lot of issues we've had with that dispatch phase place. So when it comes to each of ease of use, uh, we've got a 
pretty clear separation of concerns, unless you do something funky. So the action creators are for getting the data, the stores are for actually doing stuff with the data, and the components are for displaying the data. Uh, so you don't have this soup-like structure for the store that gets the data, does stuff with the data, and then just grows and does everything. Uh, the context, because we, uh, we are isomorphic, so if you think about it, uh, if you launch multiple requests on the server side and you've got global objects, so global stores, uh, you're in for a lot of trouble because those stores are going to be written to from many requests at the same time, probably, if someone visits your page. Uh, and you'll just get gibberish in there. So we work with context. The context is essentially like, you could think it's a, a, it's a thread in a sense. So it's the smallest abstraction uh, of all the data that, that is needed, so of all the actions and all the stars. It's very cheap to create. Uh, as, there's also a disclaimer here, if you don't do something ridiculous. Um, and the context is available implicitly. So in Reflux, uh, there's no context, but in Flexible, the context, you actually have to pass it in yourself. You have to create the, um, the higher order components, you have to create the context, but in here, it's all automatic. And the API is the same uh, either in components or stores or, or actions. It's always there at the same place. Uh, it's also possible to fire an action from the dispatch phase. I know it's a big list, but we'll get to the code soon enough. So um, you, you can fire an action from the dispatch phase. Uh, if you really have to do it, we are not recommending it. It's a big dis um, difference between the Facebook dispatcher and what we have here. Uh, we don't recommend it, but sometimes it's desperately needed, and it really simplifies the code. And because uh, you've got a guarantee that only one action will dispatch at a time, this action is queued and will dispatch later, so you won't get any concurrency effects in here, and we support plugins, and you can also bind to all the failing actions, so you can very easily create your own error display mechanism. You don't actually have to bind to each action separately. Uh, and as I said, the isomorphisms come from free. Uh, it's just literally three lines you have to do, and if you want to customize something, you also want to, you, you can. So, now the examples. Um, I've written an example app, uh, called Manifold, and it's just a simple blog. It's deployed there, so you can play with it also. I'll just show it to you in a second. Uh, please don't change the admin password, because I'll have to reset the database. Uh, so here's the page. There's the markdown that's displayed as HTML, and there is a router included, so it works this way. But here's a cool thing. The cool thing is this is all isomorphic, right? Uh, and I'll show you the code in a second. So it works exactly the same way if some of your viewers are using this kind of browser. Uh, it works. Uh, so now to the code part. Um, where were we? Here's a store. So a store can listen to some actions. Uh, it can set its own state. And that's basically it. Uh, now in here it listens to the get action and it listens to the login action. It sets the state to be something and then it exits. Uh, you can see that the whole thing in, in the manifold source code that's taken directly from the source code. Uh, that's an action. So an action gets something from the server. The fetcher is an extension to the context. It's a plugin for the framework we, we've created. Um, and so yeah, you can get something from the server and probably do some light processing on it if, if you want to. Uh, the fetcher so far supports Happy on the back end and jQuery on the front end. I don't really know why we, we used the jQuery fetching, but it ended up being that way and then we didn't really want to change it because we had other things to fix. So uh, yeah, if you, it's really easy to write your own back end to the fetcher. So pull requests are welcome. Here's a component, so the actual thing. Uh, that's a mix-in we provide for, to get all those functionality. When the component loads, uh, we, you have to specify what data it needs. It's uh, used for the server-side rendering for the isomorphic part and also on the client side to actually get all the data it needs. 
it's specified in the load function. So in here, it just gets all gets the post, uh, gets the results. Uh, it doesn't matter what it returns. It just it needs to return a promise that resolves when all the data is there. That's the standard get initial state. It listens to those stores. There is no boilerplate, and there is context wi woven around in here. Uh, so it will work exactly the same way on the server side as it does here. And if you want some other front end for that, it works also the same way. Uh, so the context is available at this context.flux. Uh, in here, if the root changes, we just get the new post. Uh, uh, some boilerplate, and we just set the post and display it. Uh, so easy enough. That's the glue. So the actual thing that you have to add, the actual boilerplate. So you, you essentially on the client side, you add the fetcher, you add the render function that puts your thing uh, onto the page, and then you, you just put it on the page. Uh, if it's a first request, we get the state from the server. So there's no need, so the first request is going to be rendered on the server, then transferred, all the HTML is going to be transformed, and then the thing is going to bootstrap onto that HTML with no requests, no additional requests once the bundle downloads, which is a big thing, really, because uh, for our app, the bundle is like a megabyte and a half minified. So the page, if someone is using a mobile connection, or even, even with broadband, the page is going to be there in like the first 100 milliseconds and not in whatever time it takes to have a, meg a megabyte and a half downloads. And the get page context takes care of all the context wrangling, all the higher order components for actually wrapping the context and passing it down. And then you just render it to your page and you initialize the router so we actually know where we are uh, in the thing. And that's the server side, which is essentially the same thing. Here, uh, I show how you can add your own function. Uh, the fetcher, it does this really good thing, which is on, this, on the server side, the first request is going to come with a cookie, right? But then when you inject additional requests on the server side, they're not going to come with cookies because you know, there's no way those additional requests is go are going to, the requests for more data are going to know what, where they came from. So the fetcher takes care of that. That's why it's context aware. And it also does it with no explicit context weaving at all. Uh, we initialize the router and then display the thing or just throw an old note founder if there's nothing to display because someone typed the wrong address. And yeah, so that's basically it as far as the thing goes. It worked. Uh, you can try breaking it. Uh, I'll show the address in a second. Uh, so just to sum up the whole thing, we give predictable behavior. Uh, we give ease of use. We try to get rid of all the bugs that come from the fact that you can actually pass the thing around, so you can pass the state around. Uh, and we think there is much less boilerplate, at least uh, for our use case. And thank you. So that's the GitHub account for the Flux app, and this is the next is uh, the deployed version and the GitHub for the example app. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Hello. Oh, okay. Uh, so from what I saw, you're not instantiating the stores per request. Is that correct? Yes, we are. Oh, you are? Yeah, okay. we are. That's, that it, yeah, exactly. My, That's my the thing. Then. That's the thing. The context take care of all of that. So, so the stores get their state per request. The state goes through if the, the context have to be uh, reinitialized in the middle because you do something with the, with the load. That's all abstracted away. So... Uh, and also, the, the reinitializing of the source is really cheap. It's just object per store. Okay. So my understanding was that there was singleton. So my question was, how are you scaling out? But evidently, that's not how it works. So. No, no. Th that's I, I can't show you the app that we've built because it's internal. But uh, there is quite a lot of load. that it, it And it scales well, uh, definitely for, for our use. And we haven't seen any performance problems at all. So, as I said, recreating the context is just, uh, if you, 
Mm, because the, uh, the actions are essentially, they don't really have to be recreated. It's just a little thing. Uh, let me go to the stores. So you essentially run get initial state every time you reinitialize. So you could do something really computationally expensive there and you would die. But as long as you don't do that, uh, you're fine. OK. And yeah, it's a philosophical thing, I guess. But I don't really like isomorphisms for this idea that you know, if someone doesn't use JavaScript, then it's going to be, it's going to work for them. Uh, what I really think is important is the fact that the person on the mobile or poor connection is going to get your page in under 100 milliseconds and not, you know, in a minute. Uh, and yeah, I know that I went through it and kind of. Uh, said, oh yeah, that's the magic and it works, but it, it really is the case. Uh, there's no, you know, faffing around with the stores and it really works. <laughs> Meet you in the middle. Yeah, here's one. Yeah. All right, um, does uh, GraphQL and Relay solve any of your problems and what do you think of it? Well. I tend to think that a code that exists is better than a code that uh, doesn't yet exist. Like for me, it, there's no GraphQL, right? I cannot use it. And I especially couldn't use it 10 months ago. But as for now, I mean, this works. And probably GraphQL may be the ultimate solution. But I, I won't really trust in that until I see the code. So just in a couple of last weeks, um, some interesting flux things have happened. Um, I think Flamux deprecated itself in favor of reflux. And just today, I heard that Marty and Alt.js are going to emerge. And oh, please. I'm, I, I really hate Marty, but that's a <laughs> we yeah. can talk after this. Same, same thing. The question is, that are, are you seeing any kind of like um, the community actually gathering behind flux app in the sense that we can believe the flux app is actually still going no. to be alive in a, in a year? No, uh, you won't get any community support. So essentially, what I'm showing you now is uh, is what we've written, but we essentially just released that. So there's hardly, well, there's no one apart from us using it. Uh, so we can be the first, but there's, it's definitely not a project. So if you're going to use it, just bear in mind that it's not going to give you, you know, Googleable answers. You can always ask us, but which I think is a, is, is a really <laughs> an advantage, but, uh, but it, there's not going to be the Googleable answers. Uh, it, I would like to see that become a solution, but there is a long way between now and our thing becoming like a standard solution for Flex. Thanks. Is that it? Brilliant, thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.